Okay. Uh, welcome to AP European History with Dr. Brofkin. Today we continue our study of enlightenment or the age of reason or uh, the age of philosophers in France in 18th century. Uh, last time we talked about Montesquieu and this whole culture of salons and discussions and new ideas. And now uh, we should focus on the great thinkers. Uh, and today's focus is on uh, two. I hope we we'll cover two. One is called, uh, the first one's name is von Olbach. Uh, so obviously by his name uh, identifies him as a German. Uh, and then he settled in France and became a, a banker. So here's one of those rich aristocrats, but not as Montesquieu, who was a, a noble. Here, he's a banker. So he's a very modern person uh, who is probably a Protestant because he's from Germany, and he is uh, he settled in Paris uh, and uh, had a lot of money. He supported the publication of. Uh, Encyclopedia. He gave money to Diderot, and he had a salon. When you look at the people who were all gathered together at one table, it's absolutely incredible constellation. So uh, obviously there was uh, Helvetius, his friend there, another uh, philosopher and banker who will hear today. Then there was Turgot, as a great, great guy who will hear a lot. He was minister of finance uh, under Louis XVI, uh, just almost at the eve of a revolution. Uh, then there was Rousseau, uh, there was D'Alembert, uh, then there was uh, occasionally uh, Adam Smith and Hume from England who joined the crowd. Fra uh, Franklin, uh, the American who was an ambassador in England, was visiting pa Paris. He was there too. Voltaire was a part of that company as well. So this was the, just the constellation of the brightest uh, minds of France and of England at the time. Uh, so um, he he's basically he uh, made a lot of money and then he retired, bought an estate, and he went to live in that estate. Uh, and this is and he had a, a house in Paris where the salon was with all these gatherings of of, of thinkers. Uh, but also uh, he wrote a book, which is what we're going to talk about it in the most important contribution. The book is called La Système de Nature. Uh, and this is one of the most important books of enlightenment. This is where you have the uh, cult of nature that was so typical of all the philosophers. Uh, so it was published in London and in Amsterdam uh, and uh, under a false name, and it was smuggled to France. As soon it was, as it was published, the Parlement of Paris banned it uh, and burnt it. The Catholic Church banned it and burnt it, confiscated all the, uh, all the copies that were available. Uh, and uh, he denied his authorship because otherwise he would have been arrested and who knows what else they would have done to him. But he was rich and he could afford to just basically live in his estate and deny the authorship and, and that's how he got away with it. So here are some of the ideas in La Systeme de Nature. Uh, the first proposition is that nature is always in motion and there's absolutely nothing stationary. Uh, everything is moving all the time. Also, he's saying that everything in nature is chaos uh, and unity at the same time. Now, this is a very important proposition, sounds so obvious is that everything is in chaos and unity at the same time. But if you think about it more, it's the beginning of, uh, of dialectics, something that would be further developed by a German philosopher, Hegel, where he basically has dialectical development, meaning that unity uh, and chaos are in contradiction, and that is the source of development. So he already kind of uh, grasps at some ideas that would be later developed by others. Uh, then from here he makes a conclusion that what the religious people call the soul has no separate existence and it is simply a function of the body. So he denies. 
So soul has no separate existence from the body. It is a complete denial of any religious idea of a soul, which is, of course, a dramatic statement at the time when any subjection to criticism or doubt of Catholic dogma could actually get people burned uh, and executed. So but he's still saying it. Here's a quote. To say that the soul will feel, think, enjoy anything after death is like to believe that a clock broken into pieces will continue to work. So here's again a statement that pretty much is atheist. He does not believe in life after death. He denies the Christian dogma that some life continues. It is absurd. It's absolutely impossible. All of nature is against it. If you are, uh, if, if, if we're trying to understand how nature works. Uh, men or people are a work of nature and they submit to the laws of nature, not to the laws of the church or of Christianity or of any other religion. Religion cannot be understood as a source of, of law. The law is natural law. Everything is subjected to nature because nature is in control of all human activity. So essentially he's saying there's no place to God uh, in terms of explaining the nature. Nature exists independent of God, uh, and it's only ignorance and fear that created God. Here he comes very close to Karl Marx, who would a century later write that religion is the opium of the people, and it's been created to subjugate the masses. Now, th then he proceeds to the argument that morality is something that the church and religion provides. And he says that good and evil are mental constructs that have nothing to do with nature, because in nature, somebody is devouring somebody else, is constantly going on the, pro the process of survival of what later would be called survival of the fittest. So he kind of predicted what, what Darwin would say a hundred years later. But he's saying that nature really is struggle of one to, against another to survive, and one something devours something else all the time. And that means there is no such thing as good and evil. And again, here he almost, uh, you know, foresees a hundred years later of philosophy beyond good and evil, something that would appear at the end of that. Uh, Schopenhauer and others who would say pretty much the same thing uh, later. He, in other words, morality is something that is nothing to do either with nature or with religion. Uh, because nature has its own laws and religion invents morality as something to back up its uh, claim to necessity. So in a sense, he's saying pretty much like Hegel uh, would be 50 years later, everything is necessary, everything is in balance, and everything is in mutual interdependence. That is the key idea of uh, l'esprit uh, de nature. Now we go to the next topic, which be morality and state. Uh, he here is, is a sense a very important program uh, where he claims that the church and state should be separated. Uh, a kind of a program that will be implemented only after the French Revolution. A lot of these ideas will actually be implemented, and that is why it's so fascinating that here we have a person who uh, kind of made a roadmap of what will be done. Uh, with these uh, new uh, understandings. So church and state should be separated. Work is the source of all wealth. He's saying that before Adam Smith or simultaneously with him, and then it would be confirmed by Proudhon and Karl Marx. Um, hereditary wealth, he should said, should be abolished. This is anticipates the... Uh, reforms and, and taxes of the 20th century against hereditary accumulation of wealth in most European countries. So he kind of uh, pre predicted what would be done in social legislation about about 100 years. Now, uh, ideas on economy and on the government. Here he writes, the role of the government should be 
to allow the merchants and the entrepreneurial class to do as best they can. Again, this is a, uh, something that would find itself in a um, formula, laissez-faire capitalism. So he uses this term, laissez-faire, let us do things unimpeded from any regulation and strictures of the government. Let us remove the obstacles and engage in entrepreneurial activity. The best thing uh, that the government should do is make life easier for people to pursue their interests. He also had a very interesting idea about colonialism, uh, commenting on the British uh, rule in India and grabbing India as its possession. He, he wrote, one day the Indians would rise and acquire weapons and shake off the rule of the British. Again, another prediction that was about 150 years uh, before its time. Uh, and finally, one other thing that he uh, predicted is that the per he would be the same with, with Helvetius, who would write after him, uh, is that the, the in, in nature, what people are striving to do is to have uh, is to pursue happiness. People want to be happy. So if you put all together all the things that he has written about, that you need liberty, uh, you need property, and the pursuit of happiness, he put in different ways something that uh, Thomas Jefferson would repeat a few years later in 17th, uh, 17th, 1776 in the Declaration of Independence, liberty, property, and pursuit of happiness. So you could see how people who read other people, these philosophers, formulate ideas that would be a program uh, for American Revolution, for French Revolution, and uh, later we will see how other enlightened rulers such as Frederick the Great, Catherine II, and uh, uh, Maria Theresa would use it. Uh, okay, so this is uh, good enough on, uh, on Olbach and um, 